four times. He has made 12 Pro Bowl appearances and is a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Very impressive accomplishments. Yet he considers his most important accomplishments those that have been achieved off the field. In 1999, he established the Payback Foundation to promote the future success of disadvantaged youth. He has also a long-standing relationship with St. Vincent's Hospital in Indianapolis, which renamed the Children's Hospital, the Paid Man and Children's Hospital at St. Vincent's. We all work in environments where stellar leadership and preparation can make all the difference in the world. This gentleman exemplifies that. Please give a warm welcome to Peyton Manning. Figure that you can be a warrior or a warrior. 
Waiting around for someone else to make or execute the plan is just not an option. As the quarterback or leader, you have to be willing to take the risk, to stay in the pocket or run the ball when the stakes are at their highest. You have to be willing to take a chance even when you have doubts. Because if not you, well then who? Make a decision, then attack that challenge at hand as if you're facing your toughest competitor the game is on the line, and that game is your Super Bowl. For me, at that point in my head, I know it's the best choice. Obviously, I don't always make the right decision, but I believe in my decision at the time, and on the field at least, I'm right more than I'm wrong. The key is, though, no hesitation and no stutters. When you demonstrate 100% confidence in your decision, your team will follow. For instance, in audibles when the quarterback is under center or in the shotgun, everyone is lined up, ready to snap the ball, and then he changes the play. Or in the case of a certain Buick commercial, I audible to pop a bear. <laughs> I understand you're the people responsible for the talking Buick, and I appreciate that. I've become known for making audibles, and usually it's when fans see me wildly waving my hands, walking up and down the line of scrimmage, changing the previously planned play. And mostly it's because of something I've noticed on the field. And to my teammates, the inflection in my voice sounds like I have the best play in mind at that particular time. They hear that, and because it's obvious that I believe in my decision, well, they believe in it too. As a result, they're going to block better, run better, do whatever their job is better. When a quarterback or any leader of a group, when they stutter, or after an audible, they switch back to the original play, or they call a timeout. The opponent sees that hesitation, bolstering their confidence and ultimately their defense. And I don't know about you, but I don't need my opponents fighting me any harder than they already do. To get to that level of confidence, though, really requires an enormous amount of preparation. Decisions aren't as straightforward as math problems. Usually there is no one right answer. But you just can't build decisions on hope. Important decisions need a stronger and more stable foundation. And in my opinion, the quality of a decision starts with having a clear direction and gathering the right amount and kind of information well in advance. As fast as everything changes today, thorough preparation is absolutely essential. And that requires reaching a certain knowledge minimum if we're going to make effective choices. Not too long ago, I heard the term open expert. That means working really hard on your expertise. If you're a teacher, on teaching, or more particularly, what you teach. If you're a developer, on understanding code. Well, as a football player, there are multiple layers of required information, and I work hard on my expertise, which leads to respect of that knowledge. Essentially, that means I have to learn to trust my decisions while staying flexible enough to look at the situation with the eyes of a rookie, with an open mind. Speaking of rookies, this past season, I had one of our Broncos draft choices come up to me, and he was nice enough to tell me that I was his favorite player when I was in college and he was seven years old. <laughs> and he said, would I autograph a jersey? And I said, sure, is it you know, for your brother or your high school charity? He said, no, it's for me. I'm a big fan. I love watching you play on ESPN Classic. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I have had lots of practice, though, making significant decisions under intense scrutiny, which has conditioned me to somehow blot out both the spotlight and the noise, and focus on what's important, and then just decide. On the football field, I have to make split-second decisions, but I can do a lot of the work up front, so when the pressure is on, I feel calm. Each week, I gather every relevant piece of information about my opponent. For years now, we've used video technology to break down every tendency a defense has. Does a cornerback play bump and run coverage or off coverage? Does X team blitz on third down inside the 25 yard line? By the time I'm on the field facing that opponent, I'll know exactly what coverage to expect and best how to counter it. It doesn't matter what the situation is. I've studied it 
which helps you make decisions on the fly much faster. And I can eliminate options, which is the key, before the ball is even snapped. And as a result, I can make half the decisions I need to make more accurately and significantly faster. And it also allows me to take more calculated risks more confidently. In my opinion, strategic decision making is one of the defining characteristics of a leader. If you're the boss or the quarterback, well, that's what you're paid to do. If you've got no rank within a group, but you have the ability and the willpower and charisma, decision making is what you're drawn to. However, it's important to recognize that you can thoroughly prepare and still be hit by a thunderbolt. There are some decisions in life that just aren't yours to make. Certainly, I didn't plan on having any neck surgeries, much less four of them. But in my family, we have a saying that every quarterback and every leader really should live by. We always call it getting back to zero. Football players and people everywhere, including all of you, I'm sure, get knocked down every day. And on the field, we have seconds to pick ourselves up and refocus on what's ahead. If you dwell on what just happened, your head is not going to be in the game, and we can't be at our best. We won't see, hear, or feel the next opportunities right in front of us. Get back to level zero. Renowned author Ernest Hemingway once wrote that the world breaks everyone, and afterward, some are strong at the broken places. And that's really what I call resilience. And I've learned to savior what resilience can do for people and for their organizations. My first year as a Denver Blanco really has been a study in resilience that ended just a little shy of a Super Bowl and my receiving an award that I never really wanted to be nominated for, the Comeback Player of the Year Award. <laughs> it only took multiple neck surgeries, a year of agony on the sidelines, adjusting to a new city, new fans, new coaches, new teammates, a new playbook on an iPad, by the way, adopting to a totally different team culture and public and private expectations that range from sub-zero to a world championship. And those are just the expectations of others. It's hard for most people to understand the magnitude of the changes and the elasticity needed to work through them. Believe me when I say it was very humbling for me. After my first surgery, my first pass during my rehab process literally went about 10 feet. The trainer that I was throwing to thought I was joking. Well, I wasn't. And my normal do it till I drop approach really had to be tempered. As the doctor told me, my injury with my arm and the nerves that affected my arm was such that it's like stepping on the gas when there's just no fuel in the tank. I had to take my rehab slow if I was going to get the results that we wanted and that my new team deserved. Healing, it seems, happens at its own pace, at its own pace, and no matter how painful or frustrating it was, I had to both understand and accept that. And I had to get my new team to trust that I would do everything possible to be the leader that they expected. Then I had to get them to trust that I could lead the Broncos to be the best that we could collectively be. It required moments of clarity, both small and large. Immediately after my introductory news conference in Denver, I took off my suit, put on my workout gear, and went and lifted weights and worked out with my new teammates. It was a small statement, but a statement nonetheless. I was one of them, and I was going to put in the work to make us winners. At 36 years old and after these surgeries, I wasn't the same player that I once was, and I had to adjust to a new body. So the first brutal hit I took during a preseason game when I was plowed down by a defensive lineman, then bounced back up for more, it was a test in more ways than one. So was my first touchdown pass and our first comeback win. They were milestones. Little or big, they collectively built the confidence of my new coaches, my new teammates, and even the fans. Resilience was the reward for meticulous preparation and strategic decision making. And frankly, the need for resilience is everyone's new reality. For me, it was an injury and free agency that created my new reality. For IBM and for each of you, it may be the competitive landscape, new tools, 
our global adoption of the next big thing in the world of technology. But have no doubt, building an arsenal of decision-making skills while embracing resilience will put you as individuals and as a company in a position to compete for your own version of the championship ring. Thank you very much, good luck, and God bless you. First of all, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you all. It's great to be with all of you. Y'all having a good conference so far? We're having a great conference. In fact, I'm proud to report that Carrie Underwood was here a couple days ago. I heard Rocco Orange. Is that right? I was wearing Rocco Orange. Uh, you know, I was telling somebody backstage, uh, I hosted Saturday Night Live about six years ago, and Carrie Underwood was the, uh, was the entertainer, uh, was the singer. So, um, Somebody was asking, it seems to me that maybe even more so than playing football, I'm known for throwing passes at a bunch of kids during a skit on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> and I was sharing with them, but the woman, there's a woman, she asked me, she said, you weren't really hitting those kids, were you? And I assured her that the Nerf football was a ball, that actually the Nerf was cut out. I mean, the ball literally, it was light as a feather. I can assure you it wasn't hurting anyone. but. All these kids, however, were, were child actors, which is kind of a disturbing field, if you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but the director said, I need you to hit him, though, in the face. <laughs> you still got to hit him in the face. And so that's a, that's a milestone in itself, to hit a <laughs> seven-year-old in the face. But I felt a little bit better when, when all these ch uh, children, their parents were there the whole time you know, surrounding the scene. And I felt a little bit better when I heard one of the parents yelling at the director, I want him to hit my kid in the face. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of uh, relaxed me a little bit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what we've done is we've uh, opened up questions to Twitter. A lot of people come in. So um, we'll kind of go through some of these and get this going. So you talked about the art and the science of decision making. And so there's been a lot, of, a lot of questions out there about the decision to go to Denver, right? And uh, how, you know, the role that John Elway played in that and just your, your decision-making process in January. Well, you know, certainly I, I had a number of good options. It was very difficult. You know, I'd only known kind of football one way uh, during my time in Indianapolis. And uh, it's a, um, it was a quick change. I felt I had to make a decision quickly because I was injured. I needed to get uh, into a team's headquarters where I could rehab. Uh, and then get with the trainers and get with the coaches to learn a new playbook. It certainly was under, under a microscope. People were, you know, constantly kind of wondering what I was going to do and uh, it wasn't a real peaceful time. But uh, I kind of believe that it's up to you to, to make a decision and then it's really after that up to you to make it the right decision. In other words, I choose the different Broncos. No one can say, is that the right decision? Well, hopefully, after this year and however much longer I play, I will prove that it was the right decision for me because of how hard I worked and to make it work. But uh, you certainly study um, all the different factors and there is no perfect scenario anywhere. But I, I believe that in choosing where to go to college, in choosing whether to stay for my senior year or term pro, I really feel it's up to you to make it the right decision. And my philosophy is don't look back. It's so easy after one week to go, oh, boy, I should have gone to this team. You don't look back, you roll your sleeves up, and you go to work, and you make it the right decision. My two cents? Great decision. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate that. And we're going to brown this man for us. So, you know, when you were in Indianapolis, you had a general manager. You have a general manager at Denver that happens to be John Elway. You guys spent a lot of time together? Sure. Yeah. John's, John's been a great resource for me, uh, obviously. He's played the position for a long time. He played it at my age, at the, at the ages of 36 and 37 years old. So he has a lot of information to me as a quarterback, but yet also he's a great leader of our organization. He's been around the game, very bright, and uh, I, that was a big big reason I'm not choosing Denver, and he's, he's been very helpful to me. You know, the, the, the one word that always comes up with you, whenever, no matter where you either read about or see you on TV, is the, the leadership. You, you, are, you exemplify leadership, and you know, when you went from Indianapolis after all those years into Denver, right. 
not only into a new city, but into a team philosophy in an offense run by Tim Tebow, very, very different type of offense. And, you know, give a little bit of insight on how you led the change, because it's been a, it was a great season, I mean, for first season. Well, it certainly, uh, it was a huge change. I share a story that kind of taught me a lot about going to a new place and becoming a leader. When I was a freshman at the University of Tennessee, my first game, we were playing up at the Rose Bowl. 100,000 folks in the stands were playing at UCLA. Our team's ranked ninth in the country. UCLA is unranked. I'm third on the depth chart, really not expecting to play all season. Just kind of happy to be in the stadium that day. Keith Jackson, Bob Greasy broadcasting the game, ABC National Television. On the seventh play of the game, our starting quarterback carries his knee, boom, out for the year. Our backup quarterback was a guy named Todd Help. For those of you who follow baseball, still playing major leagues for the Colorado Rockies. Todd was going in. Todd was kind of had that signing bonus he was about to get in baseball in his mind. He wasn't real crazy about going in the game, really. <laughs> <laughs> he goes in, doesn't do much. Anyway, coach comes to me and says, all right, Peyton. He says, you're going in. You're going to play today. And boy, I didn't think I was nervous. So I looked down at all the hair mons and sticking straight up. So I'm jogging into that huddle. Our team's down 21 to nothing. We lost a quarterback for the year. Our team is not in a good mood. I remember something that my dad had told me. He said, son, if you ever get into the huddle at any point with the starters, it may be in practice, it may be in the fourth quarter of a blowout, it doesn't matter. You've got to be the leader and take control of that huddle. That's your job as the quarterback. So I remember old dad's advice. And I get into that huddle. I said, all right, guys, I know I'm just a freshman, but I can take a stand on the field right now. Get us a touchdown. Get us back in this game. Let's go. Big left tackle, Jason Lehman, about 6'5", 330, grabs him by the shoulder and says, hey, freshman, Shut the blank up and call the blank and play. <laughs> I said, uh, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> that was just great advice my dad gave me. <laughs> However, um, it, it, it taught me a valuable lesson. At that point, when I was a rookie with the Colts and my first year in Denver, is that when you change places and you come in into a leadership role, as which the quarterback is going to be, no one wants to hear what you have to say until you earn a platform and sort of earn their respect. And so from that point on, I didn't say another word in that huddle all season. I was scared for one reason. But I think these linemen wanted to see me take hits, stand in the pocket, uh, accept responsibility after a bad throw or after a loss. And, and once I did that, I earned their respect. And later in the season, especially next year, I did have a platform where I could lead, I could be more vocal. I did the same thing my rookie year in Indianapolis. I didn't say a word. I took every snap, started every game, tried to be the first one in the weight room, last one to leave the practice field. And it was no different going to Denver this year. Even though I was a 15-year veteran, I had not earned the respect of any of these Broncos teammates. And so what I had done in Indianapolis, I didn't use that as a factor. I needed to earn the respect of these guys. And, uh, being there, lifting, working, and I'm telling you, one of the greatest honors I've ever received was uh, this fall when I was voted uh, captain of the Broncos in such a short period of time. So obviously, I had done that, and I, you know, certainly, I don't have too many years of eligibility of football left, so I feel there is a sense of urgency, so I needed to get in there and do my job, but, but that was important to me to establish the respect of my new peers. Yeah, I mean, for those of us that, you know, follow football closely, if you just think about the complexity of it and the competitive nature, you know, fabulous year just to, to, so quickly. Um, and one of the questions that came in on Twitter was related to leadership. Is it is it something you can teach, or is it an innate skill? Oh, no, I mean, I think there's both. I mean, certainly there are some people that are just natural born leaders, but uh, I think you can teach it. I think there's great books on leadership. There's great leaders that uh, I, I just got back from this USO tour. Uh, I was around the, the vice chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. Name's Admiral James Winterfeld, and he was as good a leader as I've been around. He and I spent a great deal amount of time talking about leadership and, and learning new ideas. And so you can always learn more ways, and I, I encourage people to spend time talking to leaders and don't be afraid to ask questions. So, no, I think, you, I think there's different ways of becoming leaders. Yeah. So, 15 years in the NFL, all right, when you started and what you went through last year, just your thoughts on how technology has really changed your ability to prepare. You know, to make the right decisions? Well, certainly, like I mentioned, uh, this is the first year in, in Denver that I've been a part of it. All of our uh, playbooks and 
all of our film breakdowns are all on iPads now, which, uh, going back to when my dad played, I, I can remember my dad watching the film at night with the 16 millimeter. He stopped him to tape the two pieces of uh, film together and then roll it again, and then uh, it's changed so much uh, from the time I've been playing football. When I was in Tennessee in my first few years in Indianapolis, we were watching film on beta. And uh, then it went, it went digital uh, to, to, to more of a, you know, on a computer system, but you're still watching it on a, uh, on a big screen and still had to have a, um, you know, some, type of, some type of remote control on a computer. Now it's all on iPad. So now, after practice, you'll see players in the training room getting uh, in the jacuzzi, uh, icing their legs, and they're all holding their iPads, watching film, multitasking. You've never been able to do that before. Uh, if the coach has a new play that he wants to put in, he wants you to study it before tomorrow's practice, the equipment, the, the film guy is shooting that play out to everybody, they'll, they'll send you an alert, hey, look, look at the new plays on the offensive install, and so that's where it's changed so much. Of course, the information, the statistics that we gather every single week, trying to figure out tendencies on our opponent, our coaches and quarterbacks, we're using that information heavily because defenses are going to do what they do well. They're going to hang their hat on the defenses they've played all season. They have a tendency to blitz on third and five. That's what they're probably going to do when they play us. So have a plan to counter that. So it's uh, it's definitely developed, and I see it uh, you know changing even more.